You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Welcome to the Bitter Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people, and strategies that uplift, empower, and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now, your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Koku. Let me just make sure I have everything set up here well on my end. If you're live with me right now, let me know how you guys are doing in the chat room while I set this stuff up, making sure I could see the comments and whatnot as I do the show. How are you guys doing this evening? I hope everyone's fine. Uh, almost there, almost there. By the way, thanks to the folks who recently uh, subscribed. You guys got finally got me over um, 500 subs. So I just got to work hard and get 500 more subs so that we could do some more things with the channel. Uh, I appreciate you guys for helping me get to 500. Not just getting to 500, but getting uh, over 500. I appreciate you. Uh, I see in the chat room we have daily affirmations by Pauline says doing well glad to hear that uh, I know Kevin K is here somewhere hope he's doing well also okay so I got everything set up good everything sounds right great I just want to remind you guys before we begin as I tend to do that this show is a part of a podcast network that we're building uh, the network is called KWAZ Radio. Uh, the other shows on the network, shows that you should be ch- uh, tuning into as well. For example, this is DAX. You tune into the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community. Only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni, inviting you to listen to the pro black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Thank you very much. And then there's also the Queen's Council Show. Check out the Queen's Council Show as well. Uh, I see in the chat room we got the Pro Black Perspective saying, Peace, bro. Peace to you, brother. The Pro Black Perspective goes on to say 500. Congrats. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, I appreciate everyone who helped make that number up you know so i appreciate it the aim is now to get the next 500 all right and while i'm here you guys go make sure to check out the worship that's held every sunday morning by the pro black perspective uh he's in the chat room you could click on his name i think and f- follow him on youtube as well uh make sure to check into that show the pro black perspective good show always a great listen um i tend to listen to that show while you know doing stuff for my week and it, it always makes me have to pause and really check out what's going on and and listen to what's being said so you guys you know check out all the shows on kwaz radio all right with that said we're doing a show called blackmail uh female relationships not blackmail blackmail female relationships and uh you know it didn't dawn on me when i chose this paper i, I realized it today that this is around that time when you folks get enamored by, when a lot of folks get enamored by the little white baby with the wings and the bow and arrow, right? It's the Valentines. And so uh, it was just a coincidence really until I saw the setup for the show today. So we, you know, I guess it's uh, timely and now we're going to discuss black male female relationships some observations 
a paper by Ose Mensa Abarampa from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Um, if you're new here, make sure you hit the like button, make sure to subscribe and click the bell to be notified when I'm live again or when I upload new content. And if you're not new here, uh, welcome back. Make sure to make your presence known in the chat room so we can have a, you know, a dialogue and make this show more dynamic than it would be if I was just reading a paper by myself. All right, so to begin. Uh, Male-female relationships, some observations. This article examines the relationships that exist between black females and black males and offers suggestions as to how the rich religious traditions and familial practice, uh, principles that undergird the black heritage can be recreated and adapted for use by black children today and in the years to come. Let's see what this religious stuff is about. This effort has become necessary in light of the increased sociological attention given to the problems that exist in black male, black female relationships and the quote unquote crisis that exists within the black family today. Overall, there seems to be general agreement about the existence of unhealthy conflicts between black males and black females. Problems in the relationships are largely discussed in terms of such factors as institutionalized racism and sexism, the scarcity of black men, the dating game on the part of both black men and women, and the distresses and strains that confront individual partners in their day-to-day -day activities. This study briefly discusses these ex explanatory uh, variables and suggests ways by which relationships between black males and black females can be improved beginning from the formative years of the black child. I see in the room we got Coach Peters here. He says, happy to be part of the podcast. Coach Peter, I appreciate you, as you know. I uh, appreciate all you guys for being present. And I hope that this paper, the topic of this paper is, you know, is, is, is of interest to all of you. I know some of you in the chat room are in relationships. I know you're either a black male or a black female in the chat room. So let's see how this paper resonates with all of us present. A review of the literature focused on black male female relationships reveals two major social forces the impact of society and its major institutions on the one hand and the influence of persons and groups with which individuals interact on the other basic to the social structural and institutional forces are sex ratio imbalance among blacks racism sexism and racial discrimination that manifest themselves in the form of income inequality and unemployment among others at the group and or individual level the process of socialization stresses in the home resulting from financial problems and the male double standard are important factors it must be pointed out that these forces exert differential influences on various income and age groups as will be clear in the discussion that follows. So we come to the section called sex ratio imbalance. Uh, in the chat room, the pro-black perspective says, uh, hoping this helps me get cuffed. I hope that for, I hope that, well, I hope that for all of you, right? Hope this paper helps everyone indeed. Hoping to get cuffed. I can take that a different way too, by the way. Uh, sex ratio imbalance, according to Jackson, there has been an almost continuous decline in the number of black males available to black females since 1850. In 1908, Kelly Miller noted that numerical disparity between the sexes exists in 1900 in all U.S. cities that had a black population in excess of 20 thousand with the exception of chicago as can be seen from table one the sex imbalance has persisted into the 1970s and 80s the number of adult black male singles available to adult black female singles increased from 64 males to 100 females in 1972 to 70 males to 100 females in 1984 
but declined in 1986. More significant, the sex ratio imbalance is most pronounced in the age range of greatest marriage ability. See panel two, table one. Generally, the sex ratio declines as one moves, and this is the table, let me finish that thought. As one moves from the younger to the older ages, the sex ratio declines as one moves from younger to older ages. For example, with the exception of the 40 to 44 age group, the sex ratio declined for the age groups ranging from 18 to 65 in 1972. As would be expected, the sex ratio oscillated for some of the groups. In general, however, the male shortage is a reality for all age groups, especially 20 years and older, in spite of the defects that may exist in the statistical sources. You know, when you, when you think about um, the dating scene, right? Especially you go back to your, you know, your, your 20s and stuff like that. Um, in reality, um, there were fewer guys than there were women, right? And I, I believe that, sorry, I believe that kind of plays into like all the, you know, all the sweethearting, right? That be going on out here, the side chicks and all this kind of stuff, because there's not that many men, right? There's not as, uh, as many men as there should be, who's not getting killed, is, is going to prison, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So let's see if this paper uncovers some of that. Do you guys feel like uh, in your, especially, I mean, what, answer this in two ways. At your age, whatever that is, do you feel like there's more women than there are men, right? And in particular in your 20s, say, you know, in your earlier days, if you're not in your 20s right now, did you think, did you feel like, wow, there's more women than men out there in the dating game? The implications of the imbalance in the sex ratio for black male female relationships are obvious. The low sex ratio puts black women at a disadvantage in mate selection. As a result of the black male shortage, there is an intense competition for the available few. As Jesse Bernard in 1966 says, has noted, black women have to compete for a relatively scarce good. And when they look forward, oh, sorry, sorry, scarce good, when they look forward to marriage. Staples in 78 has, has calculated that for certain age groups in certain demographic areas, there's only one black male for every, black, for every five black females. The implication here is that in the course of dating, the female may have to bargain on the male's own terms. Huh. Staples described the situation quite dramatically. Quote, to bargain effectively, the black woman must use the enticement of sex. Given the abundance of women around, he does not have to wait too long. And her alternatives are limited because of the shortage of men. Emphasis added. Uh, I, I definitely feel the truth in that. I definitely feel the truth in that. Uh, what do you guys think about that statement? You can't be cutting up when there's four other women I could go and choose from, right? Now, what does that mean for nation building, right? When, when, when you know, we talk about nation building all the time, what does that mean for nation building? First of all, the shortage of men is not good for nation building, right? As a primary protector, you need your men, right? Uh, but on the other hand, when you have this case where there's so much healers, so much primary healers that are, are the women, right? What does that mean for nation building? So how, the, the, the thing I wanna, you know, get a, 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 an idea from you guys is like, how does this imbalance, right? How does this play out? for us in terms of trying to build nations, right? That's the question I'm asking. 
how does this imbalance play out right in terms of us trying to build nations we know that the men in shortage is not good for nation building but but how does it play out having more women than men right is this by design is this specifically by design you guys answer in the chat room to continue the impact of the sex ratio imbalance is felt in other ways as well. Miller in 1908 has long pointed out that these leftovers or to be leftovers often fall prey to the temptations and manipulations of men both young and old. Jacqueline Jackson 1978 has argued persuasively that there is a casual relationship between the surplus of females in the black population and the prevalence of the female headed family. In a recent report, issued by the Milwaukee Urban League, the substantial difference in the number of black females versus black males between the ages of 20 and 54 was suggested as a contributing factor to the rather high coincidence of unmarried motherhood among blacks in Milwaukee. Obviously, the sex ratio imbalance has limited the opportunities for single black women to marry and for those who have been widowed or separated by divorce or, or desertion to remarry. Hmm, interesting. In the chat room, I see there's some activity. Uh, Kevin Kerr, 42, says, in evolution, there's always way more females than males. In the 90s, many boys in eighth grade wanted to go to Murray Bertram High School in Lower Manhattan. The ratio was like five girls to one boy. Okay. So Kevin Care 42 says there's always a, a higher ratio of females um, from an evolutionary standpoint. Okay. I mean, the fact is, and uh, uh, hold on, Daily Affirmations just posted something. Daily Affirmations by Paul. Y'all make sure follow Kevin Care 42 and Daily Affirmations by Pauline. I know Kevin Care has a uh, uh, you have the, the wrench, so you have the ability to post your link in the chat room. Post your link, let people follow you on YouTube. He's a photographer, does good, good work. I've worked with him in the past. Uh, you should check him out, check out his projects as well. Daily Affirmations by Polly, make sure to follow her YouTube page as well. She always has something positive to say every day on social media. So it's, it's a well worthwhile follow. Uh, she says in the 80s, a Caribbean lawyer in her 30s worked for an oil company in D.C. She said she stopped looking for men in her status and said she would marry a FedEx or UPS driver because men were so scarce. That's a that's crazy. That's wild to me. That's wild to me. But I, I, I think I might be able to share this this little uh, story at the end, you know, somewhere here about something I've observed and I spoke to a, a, a black woman about it recently and she gave me some insight on it. So just stick around. To continue, the effects of the sex imbalance are particularly hard on college educated black women. This might be, this might be my opportunity to tell the story now. Besides the fact that black women in general prefer to date and marry partners from their own age group, they also set very high standards for their mates. As Staples in 1981 has rightly observed, if a black woman were to relate to only men with unblemished characters, there would be very few or none left in the pool, since many of the desirable ones would already be married or seriously committed to someone else. Such expectations on the part of the college-educated black woman go only to intensify the competition for the available few of the opposite sex. While some black women have reacted to the black male shortage by having babies outside of marriage, others are without any meaningful relationships. So, I had this conversation with a young lady recently, and I've noticed, so, so you guys know that uh, black women are the most educated, most college educated demographic uh, in the US. And the, the top two majors that they tend to major in is nursing and teaching. 
and I was making a, a, a joke kind of, but it, you know, we, we ended up in a conversation about it, that the most nurse is mostly nurses and teachers, black women I see dating the dustiest of dudes. Is you guys, I see stand up in front of your job, waiting for this dusty dude to come and pick you up in your car. And you're there all an hour, uh, you know, after work waiting. And it's, it's something this young lady told me, and she's not in the chat room, I don't think, but if she was here, she could tell the story in the chat. She told me something that's interesting. She said that the difference is this. College educated or educated black men are quick to tell you they have options. And I had to think about it and I realized in my past, I've been that way too. They're quick to tell you they have options. They ain't really gotta put up with your nonsense. They can, they, they can be somewhere else. Whereas the dusty dude, right? He's happy to lay up all day. He's happy to live off you. He ain't gonna cause no trouble. He, 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 he'll grind you the whole night because he's, he, he's relaxing all day. He ain't got shit else to do but to grind you all night. He'll lay up and watch uh, Young and the Restless and all this old shit. He don't mind. But a college educated dude ain't really on that type of stuff. His ambition is too high. He doesn't need to settle and, and, and to deal with your bullshit if that's what you're on. And, I, I, and when, when she told me that, I, I looked at my life, I looked at others around me, and I realized, damn, that's true. So it, it tells you, like, it, t it tells you the situation that we kind of do put each other in, right? It's a real funny situation that we're in, even, even in our relationships. Even in our relationships. In the chat room, Daily, Affirm Daily Affirmations by Pauline said, laugh out loud. Oh, but it's true. Uh, Kevin Carefoy too says his show is, uh, sorry, his, his page is the beauty of black women uh, his page that showed the beauty of black women is NYC Beauties. So make sure y'all guys follow him as well. Kevin Carefort, who says, I believe in educating black children, no matter if you are not the father. We have to stop this vicious cycle. The next thing we have to do, and I say this a lot, is that we have to stop looking at ourselves from the point of view of outsiders. We are great people that stood on our own. We do not need outsiders' opinions. I agree. I agree. We definitely got to look at what's going on inside house and understand something. Right? By the way, I know Kevin Carefoy too from college. Right? And I'm sure uh, if we sat and talked about it, we'll realize, yo, this is, this is really what's going on. This last blurb here. Right? If a black woman were, were to relate to only men with unblemished characters, There'll be few or none left in the pool. And a lot of that has to do with our attitude, well, the, well, the attitudes of educated men towards women. You know, that's wild to me. But when you look at it, and I know Daily Affirmations by Point Laugh because I'm sure she, she has looked at the world and she sees what I'm talking about. These dusty dudes have no problem laying up all day, but an educated black dude really ain't on that. Uh, uh, An and educated black dude ain't really out here. By the way, shout out to Nikki Ren. Hello, Nikki Ren. I, I, I did see you when you said it earlier and I, I forgot because I was in this train of thought. But shout out to you, Nikki Ren. If you have any thoughts on, on this, by all means, uh, lend us your, your words, lend us your voice, right? Nikki Ren, are you in the dating game? Um, and do you see the issues in dating that we've been talking about so far? Right? Anyway, 
income inequality and unemployment. Perhaps at the core of the problems in black dating and marital relationships is the perennial problem of jobs and adequate income to provide the material base for meaningful and satisfying relationships. And this is a big one too. The security derived from one's employment has a bearing on one's sexual behavior. Let me read that again. The security derived from one's employment has a bearing on one's sexual behavior. The extent to which a relationship can be satisfactory depends in part on the extent to which one enters the relationship without having to worry about economic support. In other words, a successful relationship depends partly on the extent to which partners are economically self-supporting. That's why I said at the start of the year, man, we gotta be about, about abundance. We have to be about abundance. And not just in, in money, but of course that's important. We have to be about all around abundance. That stuff, let me tell you something. All around abundance takes away a lot of the problems that you'll face in life. For example, if you have the if you have a, if you have all around abundance, right, going to Africa wouldn't be no problem for you. Not just because of the money, but you wouldn't even consider the time en route to Africa. Abundance will take all of that shit away. You just go and sit your ass back in a chair, sip on a drink, take a nap, and wake up when you're in Africa. Abundance is important. You have to have abundance. If you want these relationships to work, there has to be some abundance. Nikki Ren says, I am dating, and oh yes. Uh, but oh yes. Uh, Kevin Care 42 says, my most valuable education came from so-called street dudes, ex-cons. College is not going to teach you anything. College only teaches you to follow, obey, and stay in your place. Uh, Daily Affirmations had said something about abundance, but I think she deleted it. Uh, yeah, so let's continue. In other words, a successful relationship depends partly on the extent to which partners are economically self-supporting. By several counts, however, blacks have not fared well compared to whites, for example. For many years, the median income of black males and black females 14 years old and over has trailed behind that of their white counterparts. That's no surprise, right? And that's by design. In the last decade, the median income of black males has never surpassed two thirds of the median income of white males. Worse still, the income gap has repeatedly shown signs of widening. Although black females appear to compare, although black females appear to compare more favorably with their white counterparts than black males, their situation in reality is far worse than any one of the other three groups. More important, when differences in work, with another table, experience, table three, and educational status, table four, are taken into account, the income gap still persists. Admittedly, the, uh, admittedly, the income gap closes somewhat to about three quarters for black males with various educational statuses and to about nine tenths in the case of black females. It is disheartening to observe that while that white males with eight years of elementary school education, eight years, uh, stand a better chance of earning more than black males with four years of high school education. Think about that. And, and, and this is where it goes back to what Kevin Care 42 says in the chat, right? In dating, I, I always noticed back in the day that it was always this kind of thing where, you know, the, the black woman you're trying to date we're comparing you to your white counterparts back in the day. If you guys in the chat room have experienced that, press one. 
right but you really can't compare a black i mean the statistics show you right that without a concerted effort you can't really compare a black male to a white male under the circumstances right again without a concerted effort and it takes time to get to the point to have that concerted effort right but you can't compare this white boy who has eight years of primary school education has a better chance of earning more than than someone with four years of high school education that's just we was talking about grade school education imagine what it's like on the college level um daily affirmations by pauline says abundance is key but stress from jobs can hinder personal relationships that 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 is true so while i'm speaking abundance right i mean i i did say too i'm not just speaking about money but i am but but i in a sense i was talking about money in that you know listen money might not be might not be the the heal all but it'll it'll heal a lot you understand uh so yeah so yeah these jobs can cause it too but that's why you have to have abundance too the abundance to have that f you money to not have to deal with these people's jobs all of this stuff is interconnected and it's all interconnected in such a way where you are the disadvantaged you lose on the other side all right uh nikki ren says with me the guy doesn't have to have a degree a steady job uh, ambition is okay with me now see what nikki uh, ren just said doesn't have to have a degree per se but a steady job and ambition is important but like i told you in my little story in my in my discussion with the with the sister in my observations and her explaining what's going on in my observation like a lot of these these educated women nurses teachers especially are laying up with some dudes who are sitting in the park all day i live by a park why see dudes setting up to sit down in that park all day and they're cool with it right but the reason why is because they're not really bringing no headache to these women they laying up they taking a little talk right and they doing stuff to counteract that talk whereas the educated dude he's he, he he's not there too long for that uh kevin care 42 says we are playing their game you have an answer to their question they changed the question he didn't answer later answered one to my question and he says we have to do it our way the excellent and hard way shout out to all you guys in the chat room again like i say i know it's saturday night you could be out doing something else i know nikki ren is in miami i'm sure there's a bunch of stuff she could be doing outside there um but uh, i appreciate you guys being here with me tonight and uh we're going through this little paper it's a short paper too so we won't be here too long tonight uh so to continue besides the income gap a lot more blacks are unemployed than whites in spite of the recent announcement about declines in the unemployment rates the situation is far worse for blacks than any other group especially when we consider the fact that the pool of discouraged workers does not enter into the computations not only are blacks unemployed more than whites a lot of the uh, a lot of the employed tend to be located in less prestigious insecure jobs to the extent that one's job does greatly determine the way others see him or her and in turn the way he or she sees himself or herself then job satisfaction is a major determinant of marital satisfaction and by extension the overall satisfaction with life a steady job serves as a personal stabilizing force and hence contentment with one's marital relationships now see that's why i have a problem i i get it on one hand but the thing is we we have to we have to move from from the the steady job thing i don't knock anyone for having a job i have a job but my my efforts daily 
are to get out from under having to work for somebody right being able to work for self do for self completely and having that be the stabilizing force right I, I think that's greater than this job situation. But if you have to work a job, so be it, right? Um, in the chat room, Kevin Kerr says, I screwed over the New York Post with a copyright issue. They deleted all of my photos from their system. They thought I was dumb, but I ended up screwing them over on a big story. Ha, ha, ha. Good for you, man. We talked about that in the past, you and I. Good for you on that. You know? You can't have these folks taking advantage. That, that, this is why I'm talking about the, the steady job thing. You can't have these folks taking advantage of you. When you work for yourself, you could do what Kevin Kerr did, right? Uh, Nikki Ren says, when she, Nikki Ren says, when I say steady job, I include self-employment, of course. Okay. To continue. Jesse Bernard, 1966, makes this point when she observes that a few sociological findings are better established than those indicating that marriage tends to be more stable among the well-educated, well-paid, white-collar workers than among the poorly educated, poorly paid, blue-collar workers. Let me read that again. Jesse Bernard, 1966, makes this point when she observes that few sociological findings are better established than those indicating that marriage tends to be more stable among the well-educated, well-paid, white-collar workers than among the poorly educated, poorly paid, blue-collar workers. Now, I, for a second, I was gonna combat that and say, nah, I know some people who are the latter, not the former, and they've been solid for decades, but that's me knowing one or two people like that. Uh, when you look at the numbers on a wider scale, I'm sure that the former is true. More is more true than the, I, I, I'm sure the former is, is really the case, right? I recently watched the Whitney Houston biopic. No, sorry. Uh, the, uh, not Whitney Houston. What's my man name? The Bobby Brown, the first episode of his uh, biopic series. And if that biopic is, is, is anywhere close to true depiction, you know, Whitney, Whitney Houston was out of her mind out here. Whitney Houston was just out of her friggin' mind out here. She was a nice person, clearly. But her, her demons or whatever was just, was just wild. But what kept that together, they had the money to keep that shit together. Right? That's what I, that's what I got from the whole story. Like, they had the dough and the fame and stuff like that, and that, that was able to keep them kind of together right i never watched the reality show that, that they had but i remember there was a lot of memes and stuff off of it a lot of clips because she was on some wild shit but you know a lot of what kept that, that even from being worse right is that they had money to continue in terms of the impact of changes in the economic structure Staples in 1981 observes that, quote, black men and women are pitted against each other for social values that are becoming increasingly scarce. Read that again. Black women, black men and women are pitted against each other for social values that are becoming increasingly scarce. Staples argues that, quote, tensions in the job marketplace are often reflected as tensions and interpersonal relationships, right? This is what uh, Daily Affirmations by Pauline was talking about, right? Uh, he explains that economic change, whether for better or worse, can influence romantic involvement. Economic change, whether for better or worse, can influence romantic involvement. 
Of course, this explanation may be partially born out of the patterns and trends in the business cycles, as well as the marriage and divorce rates. The point to remember, however, is that gainful employment is not just an individual goal. It is also a societal mandate in the sense that having a job gives one a feeling of being a part of society besides earning a living. Do you guys, how do you guys feel about that statement? Let me read it again. The point to remember, however, is that gainful employment is not just an individual goal. It is also a societal mandate in the sense that having a job gives one a feeling of being a part of society besides earning a living. You guys post your answers in the chat. I'll read them live on air. Let me check out what's said in the chat room since I was talking. Uh, Kevin Care 42 says, don't trust anyone named Clive. KW Dawn 7 is here in the room. Shout out to KW Dawn 7. He also say what's up to KW Dawn 7, regular guy in the chat room here. He says Whitney Houston was a victim of homophilia. Oh, I ain't doubting that. I ain't doubting that at all. Uh, Nikki Wren, I wonder if that study included couples. One of that study included couples who married as a business arrangement, combining assets, not so much romance. I would venture to think that they wouldn't include that so much, but that's an interesting thing to ponder, right? Uh, Kevin Kerr says, just over broke, that's a job, just over, but that's true. That's really what a job is. A job keeps you just over broke. It gives you enough to be able to get up, go and do what they need you to do, go home, eat something, sleep, and get up and do the shit again tomorrow. All right? You have just enough to pay to pay the the main bills in your life, right? While doing the shit that they need you to do. That's really what a job is. That's why, you know, every one of us needs to have that entrepreneurial spirit. Again, if you have a job, I'm not knocking you, right? I can't because I have a job too. So I, I, I don't knock folks for having a job. Not everyone can be an entrepreneur, by the way. Some people have to work for someone else. That's just what it is. But what we want as black people in terms of nation building is we want to be able to, to provide jobs for our people. For those people who can't be entrepreneurs and who have to work for someone else, they should be working for us, not literally someone else. And that's the thing that we have to work towards. That's the thing that I'm working towards constantly, right? In the, in the, in the chat, the pro-black perspective says, money better than a job. Though without a job, your partner almost always gonna wonder why you ain't wash the dishes or sweep the floor. Amen. 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 Listen, that what the pro-black perspective said there, is absolute truth money is better than a job that's a fact what if your ass ain't working you gonna catch hell in that household if you ain't doing the other things Shit, you you catch hell working and still not doing those things much less you ain't working and you ain't doing those things you ain't washing the dishes you didn't sweep the floor that's your ass inside Right? But some guys, like I talked about earlier, some of these dusty dudes have that ability. They ain't doing none of that shit. Right? But they're doing some of the other little things that women tend to like. The pro black perspective. The pro black pro black perspective says, my man, my man's singing the gospel. Oh no. <laughs> uh I was singing that song from the Sydney Portier film. You know, you guys know that Sydney Portier film? I can't think of the name right now. But it's where Sydney helps these nuns build a church. Uh, um, Amos, uh, KW Don Seven says, Amos Wilson mentioned the importance of having a job with respect to giving one a purpose in their daily life. Coach Pete says, it's better to be an entrepreneur. Yeah, absolutely. But Coach Pete, and I know Coach Pete a long time. Coach Pete, I'll say this. A lot of folks don't have it in them to be an entrepreneur. Let me tell y'all something. 
a lot of people throw around this term be entrepreneurial right entrepreneurial ain't easy let me tell you something when you because i'm I've, I've i've gone through and i'm still going through it when you have a product or service you're trying to get out there there's so many barriers to entry right there's so many barriers to entry not everyone has the fortitude to withstand that stuff so that's why i say like in, in in all honesty right in all honesty as a nation or or as a people we're gonna have people who ain't interested in going through all that they they're they're quite comfortable clocking in clocking out of a job every day and the thing that i want is for our people to start producing the jobs that our people clock in and clock out every day we shouldn't be going to clock in and clock out uh with these folks these other folks and you know i'm you know who i mean by these other folks we shouldn't have to be doing that we should be creating industries right look at what marcus gavi did right and then the nation of islam picked up you know picked it up right we should be the ones with the dry cleaners right with the uh with the factories with the warehouses right the things that our people tend to 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 work in and so for those who don't want to be the entrepreneur we should be giving them those jobs but absolutely correct all of you in that you know it's better to be to to have your own money right than to have to get it from somewhere else right uh kevin carefoy too says uh, coach pete yes uh kevin carefoy who says been one since 2002 it weathered me kw dawn seven says i could never see myself as a house husband even if i had to do menial labor and that's a man's response right there what, what kw dawn seven said there's a man's response right um as a man so when i talk about the dusty dudes earlier as a man like i can't just lay up with a woman right and do all the shit she wants to do and likes to do watch all this watch all the stories on tv and all that old shit i i i just can't do it i just cannot do it and i don't think that's a i don't necessarily think that's an educated black person type mentality i just think that's a man's mentality i'm kind of good on that um daily affirmation by pauline says although a job is a form of modern day slavery with un with entrepreneurship it is tougher to make a dollar and folks tend to not be as loyal to small businesses nothing but a word right there from daily affirmations uh with pauline you know uh again that's why if we're gonna if we're gonna if we're gonna have people going to you know some form of a plantation is it, better it's better uh black plantation right and i know that sounds kind of bad kind of odd but you guys know what i'm trying to say right um you know how cool would it be for kevin k or for a a photographer right if he has to do business with anyone it's not business with these white newspapers but it's business with a black newspaper right he's still his own man making his money and he's doing work with a black newspaper right so so yeah so that, you know that's what we want to do but some of you guys in fact all of you guys have said something on point today that we got to keep in mind when we're talking about relationships right when we're talking about relationships we got to keep this stuff in mind this brings us to a section called socialization at the group and or individual level inadequate socialization of black males and black females in the early years is claimed to produce the effect of setting them up for conflictual relationships in the adult years you guys have been around for those of you who have been around this show for a while now you know i've talked about this in the past when i've talked about relationships right uh we as a people we don't really teach courtship and when you talk about cu curriculum that's something that should be included right courtship rituals and that type of thing we don't teach courtship 
so the youth just kind of go about it the way they see other people going or, or, or the way they see bigger adults doing it and that's one of the worst things you could have a child do learn something by watching an adult without understanding or, 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 or without getting the, the, the fundamental understanding of what the adult is doing. I always liken it to a child, a small child will look at kids make breakfast, fry an egg or something like that, and think, oh, I just got to pour the oil in the pan, turn the, turn the fire on underneath it, and I, I just fry an egg. But they don't know how much oil to pour, pour in. They don't know how high to turn the flame. And they go and they burn down the house. We supposed to have a step for them or steps for them to uh, to go about courtship. You know, if you go back and you look at like Malcolm X's story, for example, there was a system in place for him to meet his wife, right? And there was a time when we had those systems in place where, you know, the, the, the socials, the, the, the local dance, this, that, and the other, we had ways of which you went about it. You don't see that anymore, right? As Nikki Ren says in the uh, chat room, they're learning from TV. So you're learning something, something real and something real serious from something fake. When you watch romance on TV, it goes from meeting to grinding in a half hour to an hour. That's not real life. So how we social, we got to start socializing our people to have these strong relationships. And a part of that socialization, that, that courtship ritual is, you know, understand how you're going to provide. How are you going to be the primary protector of your mind? As only to say point out in his, talked about in his recent warship, how are you going to be the primary protector and secondary healer as a man? Or how are you going to be the primary healer and secondary protector as a woman? What does that look like? What does it look like to keep the relationship solid and, 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 and to introduce new individuals to your relationship, meaning children? A lot of us just kind of go at it and we kind of learn along the way. And then, you know, you're 10 years in and you realize, ah, I messed up. I should have been doing this already. I should have been doing that already. continue the earliest social influences on an individual come from the family included in these social influences are sexual standards and sex rules held by parents as franklin has observed parents and other agents of socialization consciously or unconsciously pass on to black children non-complementary sex role definitions that serve to tear the sexes apart rather than pull them together black females internalize two conflicting definitions of femininity that lead them to reject the traditional role of passivity and emotional and economic dependence while at the same time accepting the feminine role of expressiveness, warmth, and nurturance, according to Franklin. In Franklin's view, the non-complementary sex role definitions and their subsequent internalization explain why black females tend to be more androgynous than their white counterparts. Huh. In practical terms, the very same traits that the black female acquires and marshals in her career mobility efforts are the ones that make it very difficult for her to attract and hold a black man. Like Kevin Kiff in the chat room said, make sure you guys like and subscribe. All right, make sure you guys like the video. Subscribe if you haven't already. Click the bell to be notified when I'm on again. I'm usually on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, so keep that in mind. Uh, Coach Pete in the chat room says, In my business, I always teach a skill to the young people who feel unskilled and are ready to give up and talk with them about relationships and responsibility, especially if they have children. Absolutely. That's a part of that rite of passage. If more of us went through these rites of passages, or uh, uh, these rites of passage, sorry, uh, you know, it will be harder for us to give up so easy. We need mentorship, right? 
We need people who've gone through life to really reach back and take these kids and mentor them, boys and girls, young men, young women. Right? We need these systems in place. You know, we need these systems in place. You know, I've said to you guys before, I grew up in a church. And to me, church wasn't really about religion. What church was for me was more so about camaraderie. The beauty of me growing up in a church, I'm talking me personally now, I'm not talking what everyone else gets from church. But what I got from it was you had older gentlemen who brought along younger fellas, right? You had older guys who brought us along. They'll pull you aside and tell you about that girl you, you, you look like you like over there, or they'll tell you about some aspect of life, or they'll take you for a drink, or something like that. Like, that's what I grew up in, and that's something that has made me solid in life, right? Some of those, some of those gentlemen who pulled me along, they're, they're now deceased, but I'll never forget them, you know? Because that's what we need in life, and our children nowadays especially seem not to be getting that. You gotta reach back and help these youth up. In practical terms, the very same traits of the black female acquires and marshals in her career mobility efforts are the ones that make it very difficult for her to attract and hold a black man. Ladies in the chat room, how do you feel about that last statement? Right? How do you feel about that last statement? Right? How do you feel about the statement that black females tend to be more androgynous than their white counterparts? Gentlemen, how do you feel about that? Do you think that black females that you've encountered have more so been, you know, have, have been more androgynous than the white women that you observe? I'm sure you guys aren't pushing up on white women, but have you, have you observed that difference? To continue, black males, on the other hand, are socialized to internalize the masculine roles of dominance and aggressiveness. But at the same time, are taught the limitations their skin, their skin color places upon their life. Oh, sorry, their life chances. Thus, while the black male learns to enact the traditional masculine role of dominance and aggressiveness in the home, he is unable to enact the more productive but external role of provider. His inability or failure to play the provider role effectively is perceived as a sign of weakness, and the impatient black female is quick to condemn him to nothingness. Ouch. His ego gets bruised and conflict ensues. It must be pointed out that this process of socialization especially characterizes children born to low-income black parents. Lacking adequate resources, the low-income black parent socialization is largely oriented toward people rather than the physical environment. There's a heavy point in there. Consequently, black boys and girls born of these parents grow up without adequate mastery of the social-physical environment. The issue here is whether or not the possession of appropriate skills, material goods, power, and other similar conditions translate into parental attitudes and child-wearing practices, and thus into a wholesome intellectual and social growth of the black child. There's no question that one's parental background does greatly affect one's upward mobility. As Wilson in 1978 has pointed out, if low-income black parents are to be able to train their children to fit well into a white dominated society, then they must be of knowledgeable in the white socio-cultural milieu, as their middle and upper income counterparts are. In other words, they should not only know the social, psychological, and cultural infrastructure in white society, they must also be able to make those facilities available to their growing children. I um I think it was only to say who posted on on Twitter today um something along the lines of if white folks 
do they care about the environment or not like you can't say camping and deep diving and all that is something white folks do and then and then kind of say that they don't care about the environment well i look at it this way i i don't think they care about their environment in as much as they care about controlling the environment they care about dominating the environment if you go back a couple of years ago, I did a episode of the show about ego. Well, listen to that show, and I, I, I break that down. They, they care about controlling the environment. And, and that's something that, as man, as humans, that's kind of what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be able, as black people especially, right? We're supposed to be able to control the environment around us and make it do what we want it to do, right? If you see an empty lot, or, or, or a bunch of burnt out houses, we supposed to be able to control that and turn that into, you know, lo, uh, low income, in, uh, low income housing or something, All right? Turn it into a garden or something like that. You're supposed to want to control the environment around you. White folks do all that camping and stuff like that, deep sea diving. A part of that is survival. They practice in survival techniques. Something goes down, they know how to get out there and to live. Right, a lot of black folks are around these cities and don't know how to don't know how to handle themselves. Let the internet go down or electricity go up. Black folks wouldn't really know exactly what to do, especially if, if some shots are fired. In the chat room, uh, Kevin K forty two says to me it was about fear and control. Once I came off Air Jamaica. I send that religion back home. Uh, Daily Affirmation by Pauline says, I know a lady who has given up on black men because she is strong and she said black men can't take her strength. So she is pursuing marriage to a white man only. Uh, cancel that lady right now. Uh, Kevin K. 42 says, Now nah, black women are more ladylike. The white woman I've been around, especially in college, gave off a very evil vibe. I could not be around them for too long. They had a succubus type aura. Nikki Ren says the white women that I work around are masculine like. Interesting. I couldn't tell you to be honest. I don't be I don't be around white women pretty much at all. To be honest. Only in passing. Right? Um, so I don't know. I have to rely on what you guys are saying. So two of you are saying that the white men that you encountered or around act like men interesting um uh, interesting but i'll tell you this though this idea that black women tend to act like men is not a new concept this has been said for a while now at least since the late 80s or something like that this has been has been said and i i can be honest with you and tell you i've seen instances of 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 black women acting manly and it's been usually in the case of like lower income uh, black folks for doing it. So maybe it has to do with what kind of folks you're around, you know, is what you see. But I can tell you what I've seen, right? Uh, to continue, as Wilson in 1978 has pointed out, if low-income black parents are to be able to train their... Hold on, did I read this before? Yeah, yeah. In other words, they should not only know the social, psychological, and cultural... And yeah, I read this before. However, inadequate economic resources pose a major problem for poor black parents. Black men, like any other group of men, are socialized to play the role of providers, and yet opportunities are unavailable to many of them. This conflict often leads to marital disruption. As Billingsley in 1968 has pointed out, many low-income black mothers are often forced to choose between a father in the home and money in the home and make many the pragmatic choice for money. Consequently, children are raised without their fathers around, although assistance may be provided by other members of the extended family. Uh, nonetheless, the majority of those children are increasingly being reared by teenage mothers 
who themselves need parental support to ensure a successful transition into adulthood. I was in a stall at late last night and a young, a small petite black woman came in looking young and she was walking with a taller dude next to her and she tells the guy at the counter, oh, this is my son over here. And he was like, what? That, that's your son? And she was like, yeah, I'm only 34, but I had him when I was 16 or some shit like that, she said. And the next thing she proceeds to do is ask to buy a bunch of Sour Patch Kids. <laughs> um, what's the other one? Sour Patch Kids and uh, this other very childlike candy, right? And I, I stood there watching this thing like, wow, this is crazy. You know, she's 34. She has a kid who's almost 20 years old, who's 18 years old, a big, a tall dude, like close to my height, right? And she's out there buying gummy bears and um and sour patch kits. Right. She needed that. She needed the support. Right. Um. Yeah, but this this phenomenon they talked about here, I, I kind of skipped over it uh, due to AFDC requirements. You know, there's this, there's the understanding in the '60s that um, in low income relationships, the black male who might have been there, who wasn't able to get work or whatever, for women to get work off of the, to, to get money from the system, to have money in the home, they had to, they had to choose to not have the father in the home due to these requirements. And that has, that has had a long lasting effect on uh, black society, right? Because black children who grew up under these circumstances became black parents themselves and black grandparents, right? And this type of stuff was, as Kevin Care 42 says in the chat room, this type of stuff was done by design. The importance of a black male in the house, uh, even, I, mean, uh, I gotta catch myself, is this true? I, I believe the importance of a black male figure in the house is as important as having the money that they can provide in the house, right? Or probably even more important to have the, the actual person in the house and the money, right? But the money is always important too. That's why you have to think abundance a little bit. So this brings us to the section called Black Male Double Standard. Hey guys, allow me to take a quick station ID break here. I'll be back on the other side. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is DA asking you to into the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community, only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni, inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective, where black problems are addressed with black solutions. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. And we're back. Also check out the Queen's Council podcast as well. Hey, KW Don 7, I know you're in the chat room. Was it, was that the case of um, the black man couldn't be in the home in Canada? Do you know if that was the case? The black man couldn't be, be in the home if the black woman was getting support from the government? Was that the case as well in Canada? I imagine it was, but I just want to confirm. In the chat room, K, K, Kevin Care 42 said that was by design. Nikki Ren says, yes, it's true. All right. So uh, as KW Dawn answers that, uh, let me read this next section called Black Male Double Standard. Tensions and conflicts may arise when partners or spouses cannot accommodate the, extrad- the extradating behavior or extramarital sexual behavior of the other. Sex relationships in general have traditionally held very different standards for men and women. In many countries, including the United States, men and women who are not married can indulge in a number of premarital sexual activities. For married couples, it is usually the case that a double standard prevails. While extramarital coitus by the husband may be condoned, society frowns upon the extramarital sexual behavior of the wife. This sexual double standard prevails within the black community. Does it prevail really within the black community? 
I, I always thought that was that was not correct you guys let me know if you think that prevails in the black community writing about complaints black women make about black men staples in 1978 made the following observation a primary grievance quote a primary grievance is about his desire to practice polygamy while restricting her to monogamy male infidelity often means boredom with the same sexual partner the black male is surrounded by alluring women who seem more attractive or different than his own. And the shortage of black men has made black women very competitive for the available men. You know, this passed through my mind earlier, and I was wondering if this paper was gonna deal with it, was the idea that uh, if there's more women and men, right, as opposed to all of the underhandedness that goes on with competition, uh, would it be, would it make sense, again, for men with means to have more than one woman according to his means? What do you guys think about that? A lot of people say polygamy is a European thing. I'm not certain, perhaps it is. You guys might have more information than me. If you do, post it in the chat room right but if there's a shortage right and again with the idea that a man can take care of two women or more women or whatever should this be something that we look at more in, in the chat room kw don seven says i believe that the rise of transgenderism have blurred the lines with regards to androgyny concerning black women that's an interesting thought kevin care 42 says at kw dawn 7 it's a new era right while you guys answer that last question i asked i will continue reading adjustments to the black males double standards have been shown to take several forms while some black women submit themselves to the situation even though they dislike it a few have reacted by sharing men. Sharing and other sexual activities such as group sex and mate swapping are emerging as non-traditional patterns of sexual expression for married couples. I've never encountered that in black society, to be honest. I've personally never encountered that in black society. Uh, however, Staples in 1978 reports that group sex is unheard of among blacks, although it is rumored that some middle-class blacks participate in swinging, which is on a blacks-only basis. Okay. Since black women have not generally availed themselves to these emergent forms of sexual expression, the conflict between black male sexual demands and black female resistance can only lead to further deterioration of the relationships between the sexes. In the chat room, uh, Kevin Care 42 says to me, there is a book an OG put me on to. It's called The Endangered Black Family Coping with the Inner Sexualization and Coming Extinction of the Black Race. KW Don 7, uh, wait, wait, wait. Kevin Care says is by Nathan Hare, PhD, Julia Hare, ED, uh, 1984. Okay, so that's a book we could check out. So if you want to check out that book, uh, it's called The Endangered Black Family Coping with the Inner Sexualization and Coming Extinction uh, of the Black Race. The pro-black perspective says, I understood polygamy to be white by uh, Sheikh Antajoup, right? KW Don 7 says, I don't believe that the welfare system in Canada barred the man from the household. Most of the women who were on social assistance were single mothers already. Okay, okay, cool. So you have, you have the pro-black perspective saying that, calling the sheikh and to Jupe that polygamy was more so of a white thing, okay? Although you read a lot about African you know, 
African leaders who had multiple wives. I just read about the other day, I just read about Shaka Zulu's mom, right? Queen Nandi, who, 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 you know, was one of several wives at one point. Uh, so, but again, the question is, uh, is the tactic, if it's true that we have women more than men, and we have eligible men, right? We have eligible men and we have women because they're competing for, you know, this eligible man. Let's say you have two women competing for this, for this eligible man. If this eligible man can take on, uh, and I'm not advocating one way or the other, I'm just asking a question. If this eligible man can take on the responsibilities of providing and protecting for two women, should that be a tactic that folks start to employ, right? So this brings me to a section called College Educated Black Singles. College Educated Black Singles deserve special attention because Staples in 81 has discussed the quote world of this group in some considerable detail. Only a few observations will be made here. In the views of Karenga 1982 and Staples 1981, technological, sex, and other revolutions taking place in American society are at the bottom of the problems in black male-female relationships. According to Karenga, the capitalist nature of the American society has re reduced black male and black female relationships into commodities available at the right price. Ouch. Ouch. Do y'all know what that really means? Ouch. The otherwise uh, sacred human body has been reduced to a sex object with the result that relationships are focused mainly on the pursuit of sex. For college educated, the impact of the technological sex and other revolutions taking place in American society has taken a form of individualistic and material values that translate into a self-centered philosophy and an emphasis on the acquisition of material possessions, according to Staples. So we talked about this individualistic mindset on the capitalism. The thing is though, and I've said this for years now on the show, and I know I've got the ire of some folks when I've said it, you're not getting rid of capitalism. So how do you maneuver, right, in capitalism Right, g getting away from the indiv the individualistic outlook. Right, how do you maneuver in capitalism? Right, typically as Africans, we 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 maneuver as groups. Right, groups and group groups and group e economics, etc. And maybe that's something we have to really look back at. Uh, in, the, in the chat room, the pro-black perspective says, yeah, now polygamy is ubiquitous in Africa. It's complicated, but it seems, it's complicated, but it seems like only if a wife died, did a man remarry. Or if she were infertile, then he would marry again. If a wife died, okay. Right, but, th but this, this last uh, part of this, uh, section for the college educated the impact of the technological sex and other revolutions taking place in american society has taken the form of individualistic and materialistic values that translate into self-centered philosophy and emphasis on the acquisition of material possessions according to staples and that's that's interesting he contends that these values coexist with others to sustain a mythology that singlehood as a way of life is the best of all worlds even though family is still officially a sacrosanct institution to American opinion leaders. Hmm. Hmm. You know, that's why you gotta read, you know, because that's why you have to read, because like, it'll make you think about it. Like a lot of us, reach an age where we figure that, man, it's best I'd be single anyway. It's better peace of mind for me, blah, blah, blah. You go down the list of things. How many of you have had that? If you're single in the chat room, how many of you have had that thinking that, you know, singlehood was just best for you, right? You, you had more peace of mind. 
you know, on, 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 on all the things that 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 delineate from that from that idea, right? But in the at the end, you know, there's still something to be said about the family because it's in families that, like Kevin Care says, group economics starts in the home. It's in families where you begin your group economics, really, right? Daily Affirmations by Pauline says, nowadays in the Western world, more black couples, regardless of income, are engaging in threesomes and are moving another partner into their home. Also, same-sex couples are becoming more prevalent. Yes, indeed. That is true. And that's something that has to be... That's something we'll have to talk about, too, in a, in a future episode. The problem with the same-sex couples in black society, but we'll leave that for another episode. In other words, college-educated black singles are caught in a, in a dilemma. This dilemma relates to the choice between the world of singlehood versus the quote-unquote world of matrimony. While magazines, television, movies, and so on cultivate attitudes indicative of a wonderful world for singles, White society does transmit values that encourage holy matrimony. One of the reactions to this dilemma is the litany of complaints black males and females have against each other, according to Staples. While many black men and women are engaged in mutually rewarding relationships, others have grown to be wary and suspicious of each other's motives and actions. We talked about the, the suspicions that different groups of black folks have. We, we were talking about it recently along the lines of American, Caribbean, and, and, and continental blacks, right? But we have these suspicions too in, in you know, black male versus black female as well. The complaints and suspicions include lack of love, lack of commitment, the exception of college-educated black women as overly independent and assertive, and of others as so diverse as to be unable to fill a partner's emotional and intellectual needs. So if you're my age and older, you should be able to remember the 90s, particularly the mid 90s. In the mid 90s, I'm here to tell you, and I'm the biggest supporter of black women there is, but I'm here to tell you, there was a movement amongst black women in the early to mid 90s of I don't need a man. In fact, I'm pretty sure there was a song about it, right? And all those TV shows like Living Single and all that shit was created in light of it. Am I the only one here who remembers this from the mid 90s, the early and mid 90s? When I was coming out of high school, that was the lingo at the time. I don't need a man. Like, and, and black women in particular will tell you that to your face back in the days. Right? We'll tell you that uh, in your face. I don't need a man. Right? In the chat room, I see some activity. Kevin Care, 42, says it takes two to tango. Absolutely, Kevin. Pro Black Perspective says to Daily Affirmation by Pauline, is speaking facts. On dating sites, women stay saying they won't participate in threesomes or with couples. Why? If not a lot of requests. Yes, there's absolutely a lot of requests in that in that area. That's true. That is absolutely true. What's the thing now? Is the rainbow? No, it's not rainbow. It's the it's the unicorn. Right? Will you be a will you be the unicorn? And Nikki Ren says, Yep, I remember, meaning she remembers that mid nineties lingo. Right? A lot of the young women today were brought up by women who were saying that in the mid 90s daily affirmations says i remember that in the 90s and many still say they don't need a man yeah that's a that's a thing that happens you know in addition these complaints and suspicions may be brought about by past experiences 
According to Staples, if a person has a previous history of good relationships, those experiences help make commitment to futures to, to future ones possible. On the other hand, when past relationships have resulted in rejection, humiliation, and pain, that individual would ponder whether another risk is worth the reward. So, like, for example, is that one of the reasons why the I don't need a man thing was so big in the 90s? But as I remember, there was a lot of young women, uh, there was young women who, who didn't have much of a, you know, extended history in dating and, and uh, you know, especially uh, marital situations who were saying it. In the chat room, Kevin, KW Dawn 7 says couples uh, like TLC and Salt and Pepper pushed that narrative. Absolutely. Kevin K says we have to stop thinking like these outsiders. That's true, Kevin Care. Uh, we do have to stop thinking like the outsiders. The problem, the thing is, how do you how do you stop people from thinking like the outsiders? Right. It, it goes back to my er, earlier in the year conversation or late last year conversation of like we always talk about unity, but how do we get unity? Right. So folks will say. You know, and, 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 and you no, know, I'm not. This is no, no attack or casting any aspersions on you. I'm just saying in general, this idea of well, we gotta stop thinking like the outsiders. My thing is, how do you stop it? I have an idea how you stop it, but it takes a long time for, for even that idea to work. And you guys already know what the idea is, right? It's in the education. Uh, to continue, the subject of black male female relationships is definitely more complex than has been presented here. As both Staples in 1981 and Karenga in 1982 remind us, problems of black male-female relationships are ultimately a function of political and economic forces beyond people's control. Moreover, there are some relationships that are, that, that are as successful as can be and that also deserve discussion. However, as Karenga would argue, there are enough relationships in turmoil and trouble, and enough persons without relationships to make conflicts in black male-female relationships deserving of attention. What we have done so far is to call out again a few of the salient social, economic, and psychological factors perceived or shown to exert uh, regressive influences on black male and black female relationships. Following from this, the next logical question is, what can be done to mitigate the adverse effects of these factors? To address this question, we would first consider the suggestions made in the literature and then discuss a socialization technique that has potentially, sorry, that has potential of resolving some of these problems in the formative years of the black child. So that's what they, this is where they're gonna hit you with some religious shit at the end here. Right. Suggestions. So like, I, I want you guys to really pay attention to these suggestions. And as you hear them, ask yourself, is that feasible? Is that impactful? Or is that just some bullshit? Right? Feasible, impactful, or just some utter bullshit. A bull jive, as uh, my man Shannon Sharp would say. Numerous suggestions have been proposed to deal with the causes of the conflicts that exist in black male, black female relationships. At the top is the issue of black unemployment. Under the banner of the quote, black family under attack again, Joyce C. Williams of Texas Women's University calls for a drastic restructuring of the American economy, good luck with that, to shift the focus from profit to welfare. She argues that, quote, inner city ghettos have become internal colonies rather than way stations in a process of upward mobility. Similar suggestions are offered in a collection of articles that were published in the Black Scholar, volume 18, number three, uh, May of June of 1987, under the title, The Crisis of the Black Male. I'll have to look that one up. Sounds like a good read right there. It is clear that these articles, that if the public and private sectors of the American economy are not restructured, 
to ensure full employment for all, the black male population in particular stands a good chance of being decimated through such intended and unintended consequences as murder, drug addiction, incarceration, and marital instability. Perhaps strong commitment to youth training and employment programs can bring changes favorable to black youth in particular and the community in general. An increase in employment could make both young black men and women more supportive in their dating and marital relationships. Let's pause here and ask this question. If an increase in employment for black males, right, could, could make women more supportive in their dating and marital relationships, what, what is that really saying about dating and marital relationships? Excuse me one second, I'll, I'll be right back in a second. Sorry about that. So yeah, what does that really say for relationships, right? In the chat room, I see some, um, I see Kevin Care 42 says to me, think about this. We as a people are living in the past. We don't need to look without, but within. We have too much talent in our community. I agree with that, All right? But the question I'm asking right now is, based on this last thing that said, an increase in employment could make both young black men and women more supportive in their dating and marital relationships. So I'm asking, uh, what does that say about relationships? Right? I think Nikki Wren is still with us. She says, we need to educate on the importance of the black family structure. Got to have a purpose and then we can move from there. Okay, so I'll, I'll continue to read it. But again, keep in mind these suggestions and the criteria you want to attach to them, right? Feasible, bullshit, or whatever. The sex ratio imbalance among black of various black age groups is sociobiological in nature, and we would be well served to leave that to the medical and other relevant experts. As a partial solution to the black male shortage, however, Scott advocates, Scott in 1976-79, advocates the practice of some form of polygamy. He predicts that more and more children will be born out of wedlock, and many of the few available desirable black men will be shared as one-parent households headed by females continue to rise. It is very doubtful whether many black men already experiencing difficulties with marrying one woman or wife uh, like as a result of unemployment, can enter into uh, polygonous unions with all the responsibilities and obligations involved. Moreover, as sharing becomes more and more prevalent, the question that would have to be dealt with will no longer be whether non-nuclear family structures can exist, but rather whether competing families and sharing situations can coexist in, in peace. At best, only the rich can afford polygonous unions, and many would be left without meaningful relationships. So that, that's the thing about uh, polygamy, uh, polygamous relationships is you gotta be able to afford it. A lot of these dusty dudes out here, educated or non-educated, trying to have these continuous threesomes, right? that's just that's just a mix of dustiness and sex right it, it, there's no foundation to it there's no building it in it there's no nation building in it right and that's what's happening today 
right? Fella can't afford uh, a cheeseburger, but he's trying to he's trying to lay up with two women at the same time. Come on. Consequently, Staples in 1979, Franklin in 84, Asante in 1981, and others have suggested drastic alterations in the socialization of males and black females. In effect, they call for a new value system that would enable black men and women to understand themselves better. Asante in 1981, uh, in particular, is convinced that a breakdown of the African African trans transitional rights for boys and girls was more detrimental than was any other breakdown of a cultural institution for blacks. And I talked about that earlier. We don't have the system that folks are, uh, 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 that our folks pass through, right? There's very little instruction. There's, there's very little practical hands-on experience, right? That's monitored and guided. And I talk about this all the time, as you know, in the past, I've talked about this problem we have in black society where every generation has to start from scratch all the time. So you're born into a world, you have to find your way through how to deal with relationships. Then what was the point of your parents being here? If you have to come and become 18 years old or something like that, 16, 17, 18, have to figure out relationships and what's your role as a woman, what's your role as a man, etc. Then what was the point of your parents or your grandparents even being here on this planet? The pro-black perspective says, that's how it is in Africa. A lot of dusty dudes got no woman, but well-to-do got it. Then he goes on to say, bro, hating on the dusty. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, it's, it's, I gotta check myself. I'm not trying to hate on the dusty, but you know, the dusty gets to, to do the, the dusty gets to do a little too much out here. And at the end of the day, we really talking about and serious about any kind of nation building. We got to get rid of some of this dusty, this dustiness we have out here. You know, real talk, a dusty dude will quicker get a threesome out here than some, you know, than some square upright dude. And to me, that's crazy. What are you rewarding a dusty dude for? Yeah. Asante, in 1981 in particular, is convinced that a breakdown of the African tra transitional rights for boys and girls was more detrimental than was any other breakdown of a cultural institution for blacks. In his view, the value revival must adequately address this issue if healthy relationships are to be maintained between the sexes. Yeah, we got to get back to some of that. Stuff. Along some... Along similar lines, Anne uh, Hulbert in 1984 makes the following observations. Behind efforts to protect teenage bodies and improve their surroundings lies a far larger risk to influence their attitudes. However, contradictory and, intric and, and intractable they may be, adolescent temperaments are inescapably a central part of the problem and of the solution. Neither contraceptives nor job and school opportunities are likely to do nearly enough good unless teenagers are more motivated to make the most of it. About 18 years ago, Robert Staples, 1970, stressed the need for a premarital preparation for Afro-American youth. He warned, quote, there is a definite lack of continuity in American society between adolescence and manhood. Oh, sorry, an adulthood. As many American males go from the family of orientation to the family of procreation without adequate supportive bridges from the society. However, while this problem may be extant for all youth, the endemic nature of the Afro-American's life in, a, in American society lends a greater degree of urgency to helping him meet the requirements of his future marital rules. So, so that statement right there speaks to me. 
And it speaks to a certain ideology I've been having for a while. You guys who listen regularly know what it is, right? Black folks, and I, and I say this worldwide, by the way, we're in a predicament. We're in a, we're really in a war, right? And we're in this predicament where we can't afford, in a war, you, you can't afford to have too much friendly fire. Right? You can't afford for troops to be shooting and killing one another. Right? So we got to start training ourselves. This is what basic training is is in the military. And if you're in the room here and you're from the military, let me know and, and tell me if I'm wrong here. All right? But basic training is supposed to stop you from making certain mistakes uh, and, 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 and definitely from making the same mistakes all the time. Mistakes that are detrimental to the unit. Right? And so we have to be, what's the, what's the, what's the way I, I want to say this? We have to be, uh, we have to be twice as diligent in making sure that we're not doing the dumb shit all the time. Therefore, we have to put in these things into, in, things into place that, that's along the lines of really building a nation. And we gotta stick to it. We gotta hold each other to it, right? This is the greater degree of urgency. And when you have the greater degree of urgency, you have to do a greater degree of preparation, right? We need, as Kevin K forty two in the chat room says, we need to be disciplined. So this idea that you know, well, blah blah blah, the economics, blah blah blah, that's what caused all the shootings in Chicago. Let me tell y'all something. A lot of those shootings that be going on around the place here, them dudes ain't looking for no job to begin with. Whether a job is there or not, they wouldn't even know. They're not even looking for it. They're steeped in the nonsense. We got to get our people out of the nonsense. Kevin Kerr says, in anthropology, there is a rite of passage, separation, uh, middle ground, and then reintegration. All right? You have to have a rite of passage. The rite of passage, I believe, will cut down severely on a lot of what's going on. And in that rite of passage, again, the education, is the learning that, hey, you have to create, you have to create and provide resources for your own people. If you wanna, if you wanna, if you want a, a society that, that's solid, you're gonna have to do those things. And that's something we need to have this rite of passage going along. So we get our people thinking in those ways. But again, it comes back to the curriculum. Speaking of curriculum, let me post. I posted it early. I don't know if it's still around, if you can still access it or not. But let me post the link to the Discord where we're. Right now, I'm trying to build the numbers to the Discord. Uh, there is some stuff I got to bring some folks up to speed with about the curriculum uh, there's more people on the discord server now so i want those people to critique the uh curriculum that i put up a while back that i did get some critiques for i'm still waiting for a time where some folks who did the critiques can jump on in the discord we could do this as a live stream discussion of the you know of the critiques of that curriculum that we looked at uh the curriculum you know has a decent foundation but it did there's there's room for much improvement so if you guys haven't checked it out yet uh hop on the discord i'm gonna post something later that directs your attention to that resource and you guys give me back um you know your observations on it right but we we have to uh we have to get solid. We have to be more disciplined now. And it starts with the education, I, I believe. It starts in the home as well. As pointed out earlier, these observations imply a call for value revival among blacks. Hulbert observes that the question of attitudes constitutes the core of self-help strategy that is now required. Given the dismal results of 20 years of relying on federal help and the unlikely prospects of ready aid these days in response to these calls the section that follows considers the role of transitional rights in promoting healthy relationships between black males 
and females. This consideration is predicated on the search uh, by black American leaders and intellectuals for cultural traits that are authentic and viable for the life chances of black youth. Right? And these cultural traits need to be African-centered, by the way. The relevance of transitional rights for black children is that in the long term, they are an effective means of social coordination and communication and hence of understanding in black male female relationships. This observation constitutes the major focus of the discussion that follows. So that brings us to this uh, uh, part of the paper called Rituals as a Communication in Black Female Relationships. Let me check in with the uh, chat room. Chat room Kevin Care 42 says, if you're impregnant a female, you have to take care of your responsibilities. Absolutely. We have to clean our own house. Absolutely. We can't just throw our hands up and say it is what it is. Do you think the U.S. would have this military dominance? I mean, aside from the fact of the quality of our machinery they have, but you think they could say it is what it is? Nah. D.L. Martin is in the room. Peace to, peace to D.L. Martin. Family, give it up to, for, for D.L. Martin, who's arrived in the chat room. I hope you just didn't arrive um, near the end of the episode, but peace to D.L. Martin as well. All right? Uh, I, 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 as I see D.L. Martin, I hope you guys who are on the Discord server have, have recognized that uh, there's some work that's being done on the server. You'll notice that there's some books. If you go to the STEM bookshelf, you'll see some STEM books there that's good for children, good for adults. If you ever want to learn to code, I don't care how old you are, there's some books in there for coding. You can go and learn to code. I mean, the, 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 it's coding books for kids, but I mean, hell, if you never coded before, then you're like a kid in coding. So go ahead and use the books, right? You look at military science. I posted that paintball. Uh, book I talked about a while back on the show that talks about tactics like battle tactics that are uh, you know that make sense go on and help yourself check out the books remember reciprocity because of, it was because of a donation um, I was able to uh, upgrade the server that allows us to to upload larger files so make sure practice some some reciprocity, but check out the BM library. Uh, that's where you're gonna find the African centered books and then check out the bookshelf. Right now I just have two shelves, the STEM shelf and the military science shelf, but you could expect to see uh, math, uh, not mathematics, that's STEM, but you could, you could expect to see other areas uh, under the bookshelf as well. So y'all check that out, right? Uh, how many of you noticed those updates by the way? All right, how many of you noticed those updates in the Discord? Uh, Dio Martin says, thank you, brother. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, all right, check out those updates. Um, also in the chat room, um, Kevin Kerr says, we have to clean our own house. Um, he says, he also says we have to always find a way whether clean or dirty. That's how we played high school soccer in the nineties, NYC, right? We have to find a way we have to tighten up, right? So this section rituals as a communication in black female in black male, female relationships, according to D Aquile at all in 1979 the central problem for any species whose primary adaptive techniques depend largely on collective rather than individual actions is to develop and maintain social coherence and coordination over time mm. social coherence and coordination over time as the uh, as the Aquili and his associates have rightly pointed out ritual or rites of passage, for example, operates to facilitate both intra and inter group coordination. In other words, ritual is one mechanism for eliciting inter and intra group trust 
and support. To illustrate the point, every member of a given society has to adapt to the physical environment in a social context, that is, in a culturally sanctioned way of acting. To do so, each member has to have a thorough understanding of societal rules and expectations, including dating and marital relationship. This is what I'm talking about, right? We're, if we're talking about nation building, we, we're supposed to have everyone coming up thinking about what it is to nation build, right? Thinking about the rules that we must adhere to in terms of nation build, right? Which includes how we date, who we date, and how we carry out our marital relationships. Socialization partly fulfills this social uh, requirement. The task of socialization is to persuade or coerce each member to accept the group cognized environment and to follow the behavioral dicta implicit in the reality model. To transmit the content of a culture, including marital relationships, each member must be reached and convinced. The individual's attention must be elicited and maintained over time. The information must be transmitted in a fashion that leads to initial and continued acceptance. In addition, the meaning of such information must be maintained both generationally and inter-individually. Therein lies the cultural role of ritual. According to McManus in 1979, ritual's role in the socialization process is that of mediator or regulator, absolutely. He explains that the ritual context regulates or mediates the functional level of the individual seeking to adapt to or equilibrate with both and uh, with both the internal and external world. To the extent that, uh, that aspects of the African cultural heritage persist in Black America, and to the extent that collective responsibility is a cultural goal in Black America, institutionalization of translational rights becomes important. Traditionally, the Black church has been a powerful institution around which the Black cultural uh, ethos has been built and transmitted to the younger generation. However, the fact that the socialization of many black children today is largely devoid of any meaningful spiritual content cannot be seriously doubted. This is not an indictment of the black churches. The point is that many black churches have become so secularized and commercialized that the deep-rooted religiousness that once characterized blacks has fast waned, particularly among the black youth. So here's where we're gonna have to listen to some religious talk for a second here. All right, we're gonna have to listen to some religious talk for a second. In a sense, uh, but 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 the thing is, the church actually displays. Uh, the church actually displays, even today to some extent, the church displays a rite of passage, believe it or not. And it's one of the only institutions in black societies that still display some kind of rite of passage. All right, now, is it the right rite of passage? That's, that's for you guys to determine. Uh, but but it, is, it does have some rites of passage and and in its ceremonies, right, it does it does carry out a lot of life's rituals, right? Um, yeah. So, in the chat room, uh, daily affirmations by Pauline says, "I'm just getting familiar with the Discord." Yeah, a lot of people are just getting familiar. In fact, I'm just getting familiar with the Discord. So, I make a lot of mistakes and things that I post and I don't at everyone and certain groups of people don't have the permissions and all that stuff. So, you know, it's something that we'll be working on, but definitely something that's worth checking out. Uh, Kevin Carefoy too says, Code of Conduct. Goes on to say, Archbishop Molly High School in Briarwood, Queens, Jamaica, has a certain code of conduct. No fighting or negative behavior on campus ground. If you fought off campus, even after school, and the school found out you were expelled. Yeah, that's, <clears throat> you know, that's what I'm talking about. Like, 
we got us we have to have these rules right as uh kevin care 42 says it's code of conduct that we enforce daily all the time interpersonally inter individually as they said here in the paper and generationally and we tend to kind of go away from that stuff in a sense transitional rights constitute an important part of the social machinery and in many respects they are similar to the role of law or morality that enables members of a society to live together in an orderly social relation questions surrounding the rights of passage as asante 1991 has rightly pointed out are those of responsibility and accountability on the part of black males and black females appropriate rites of passage can function as effective means of socializing and enculturating the young into adults and positively reinforcing the socially experienced behavior patterns african as well as african-american history is replete with many examples how many of you are familiar with any african uh rites of passage whether you read it in a book, saw it in a documentary, film, or what have you, post that in the, in the chat room, right? To provide a general example, major changes occurring in the life of individuals in Africa were ritualized. Such changes included birth, adolescence, marriage, status attainment, or election to an office and death. And the church, again, the church, again, still kind of employs some of these things right here, right? Right? They have these, you know, these kind of ceremonies at birth and at, and at adolescence, confirmation, all that kind of stuff, marriage, right? Puberty rites were particularly important. They were performed in public to induct the young into the ranks of adults. The rituals were accompanied by changes in the structure and pattern of the individual's social life. Thus, boys and girls who underwent a puberty rite were equipped with new social and biological responsibilities. Such ritual ceremonies were occasions to instruct the young not only in community ideals, but also in the nuances of marital life and the care of the family. All right? How many of you have gone through such ritual, uh, such ritual rites? How many of you listening live right now? And I know I have a good age, age range of people here. How many of you have gone through <clears throat> these ritual ceremonies? All right? I gave you instructions not only on the ideals of the community around you, but on what you're supposed to do in your marital life and the care of your family. Not only that, the young learned about the spirit world and were to turn and were to turn for spiritual sustenance in the face of anxiety provoking and emotionally charged situations. <clears throat> it must be pointed out that the non- rational was also essential in promoting the collective good of society right uh in the chat room nikki ren to my question just now says not i all right let's get the answers from from some of the rest of you in here how many of you passed through those rituals that gave you the understanding what you were supposed to be in your society, right? And what you were supposed to be and to do when it comes to, you know, marriage and taking care of a family, right? Kevin Kerr says, I did. Me being the eldest son was given more responsibilities by grade, by grade five, okay. To continue, appropriate transitional rights for black boys and girls will not only serve to induct them into the ranks of responsible adults, but will also lead to their sound moral and spiritual development. In these programs, in these programs, notions of life, its transmission and continuity, sharing in the divine creativity, the body as a sacred entity, the family as a center of a network of social relationships, and the reciprocal networks of the black family, and the black community would constitute appropriate subject matters for discussion. It is assumed that the type of socialization associated with these rights will be performed by respectable and knowledgeable community elders. Thus, the rights will serve to demonstrate the supreme power 
and value of the community. We don't want, we don't feel a supreme power and value of our community, right? The younger generations may view marriage, for example, as purely an individual affair, but there is more to it than just an individual affair. The collective good of the black race is at stake in the outcomes of individual, marital, and familial relationships. I like that. I like that sentence. Whether or not the conflicts that exist in black male-female relationships can be overcome depends largely on the collective will of the black community. So if you want to be cuffed, like the pro-black perspective said, now you know you need to go out there and work on being cuffed. Right? I see something in the chat room here. Uh, Kevin K. 42 says, you become wise from these early experiences. You learn the art of negotiation. Absolutely. If you go through a rite of passage, you, you learn how to handle yourself. That's, a socializa- that's what socialization really means. You learn how to handle yourself. Right? The suggestion of transitional rights is an effective means of coordination and communication revolves around attempts to forge community institutional structures that will enhance black children's chances in surviving in urban America. It must be pointed out that the capacity of institutions to serve not only the purpose of their origin, but also satisfy new ones as well as change and adapt to novelties of the environment in which they function is a good measure of the character of the people and generations who populate them. To this end, blacks need to create socialization techniques, including tr- transitional rights that can educate, generate feelings of self-worth, self-understanding, and channel creative energies into legitimate outlets. Transitional rights are particularly elaborate cultural activities that can be incorporated into such major black organizations as the church, including Christian and Muslim ones. That's what the bullshit starts. NAACP, the National Urban League, PUSH, regional and local organizations such as the Institute of Positive Education in Chicago, Community Youth Council for Chicago, the Knights in Shining Black Armor in the Midwest region. How come so many of these things are in Chicago? Remember what I said about Chicago earlier? Black Mothers United for Action and a Cultural Development Center in, in Oakland, California, and Black Fathers Council in the San Francisco Bay Area, to mention only a few. It is a conceptual matrix in which a particular right is embedded that determines whether the right is religious or secular. And it is up to black community leaders and intellectuals to create and sustain appropriate ones for black children. Again, I know you guys probably sick of hearing me talk about it, but this is where you guys can get involved in creating this curriculum. There's work that can be done that's taken me forever to do because it's just me. Get involved, get actively involved in it. And, and, and there's those of you who will be more capable or know people who are more capable in terms of, uh, in terms of, you know, creating uh, these rights in terms of, you know, dating and marriage, et cetera, right? So you guys, if, you, if it's not you, but it's people you know around you, uh, we wanna avoid the secular stuff we really want to avoid the secular stuff. We don't want that Christian and Muslim thing coming into play. But if you have people or yourself, step up, and maybe that's the part you can look at doing, right? But we got to start working on this because we got to start teaching it to black children. At the interpersonal level, the significance of rights lies in the promotion of understanding among participants. As Smith points out, Rights involve behavior that is formally organized into repeatable patterns whose fundamental and pervasive functions are to facilitate orderly interaction among participants. That's a good definition. In this, that's a good definition. Let me grab that real quick. In this, uh, hold on a second, let me fix that. All right, I have to fix some of this. In this uh, connection, the activities have to be held regularly or periodically. Ritual behavior facilities, interactions, facilities, interactions, 
I think facilitates interactions because it makes available information about the nature of events and about participants in them. Smith explains that rights provide individuals with some predictive grasp of their circumstances and thus enable them to make choices about their subsequent behavior. Thus, the importance of traditional rights as a facilitator of communication is that they provide their participants with specialized frameworks for interaction. So this brings us to the conclusion. Check in with the chat room. Uh, Kevin K says, follow the money with these quote unquote black organizations. Yeah, absolutely, right? Absolutely, but following the money or not, the problem I find with black organizations, and some of them are, are legit black organizations, right? The problem I find with them is um, they don't they don't cater to the idea of of rites of passage so much. There's no programs. There's no dating. Or, there's no dating programs. Like one of the hardest things to do is to go into like a black conscious organization and interacting with you know in my case females or, or in some of your cases males uh, and you know the opposite sex and like these folks are not these folks are not are not on nothing as far as that dating thing goes it's, you know i've joked about it on the show before you talk to a sister you see a sister in one of these organizations you like them you talk to them and you go to them and they're like okay brother we marching from here up on east street we're gonna make the right on market street we don't come around on Andrews Avenue. It's just, it's just, it's just straight to the business, and that tells me there's a socialization problem there, right? There's a socialization problem going on there as well, and I think these organizations can do better and should do better in um, in organizing those aspects of uh, the black condition. So we're at the conclusion now. Uh, and speaking of that too, on the Discord, one of the things I'm gonna create on the Discord soon is a space for black women only to congregate. I'm gonna create a channel, in fact, two channels, a voice and a, a voice and a text channel where black women can congregate. One of the sisters who listen to the shows regularly, uh, what's, that's the first thing she asked me, like, how come it's so difficult to find sisters online or in person who are just conscious and you could just get together and commune with right and and um you just get together and commune and just have a good conscious time we talk about you know the things that need to be discussed amongst black women in terms of building nations so i'm gonna i'm gonna add that to the discord soon i hope nikki ran for example Daily affirmations for uh, with Pauline, for example. I hope you guys will be interested in joining that channel. It will be female. It will be black woman only, right? Uh, in the chat room, I see, I see the, I see the pro black perspective is saying something very key here. Very very key. He says that lack of dating is why Tariq and that other dude are so popular. Pro black perspective goes on to say folks want a date. Oh yeah, I mean ultimately folks don't really want to just be single. That that's just the reality of it. And if you're gonna be in an organization marching around the block all the goddamn time, you you kinda wanna I mean let's keep it real. You you, you would like to be able to cupcake with something inside the organization that you with. That's that's one of the things about, you know, that it's taken from the Bible about the equally yoked or the unequally yoked. Like you want to be equally yoked in organizing with someone else, in nation building with someone else, someone who has similar interests. If you're all in the same spaces, you know, it, it, it stands to reason you should be able to, to make something happen with someone in those organizations. Again, I give it to the NOI. And, I, and, and even I give it to the, to the black church. The black church for a long time had those those aspects in the organization, right? Youth night and all that old shit, singles night and all that stuff. They had that stuff going on, right? And that's why, like the pro-black perspective point out, 
That's a good point. That's why Tariq and them got so popular. Writing dating books. Right? But people don't understand this. People don't understand how important these little things are. Right? So this is the conclusion, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this paper. I, I'm glad to see most of you stuck around the whole time. In, in fact, all of you stuck around the whole time. I really do appreciate you guys. I know you guys could have been out somewhere grabbing a drink, watching a game, you know, doing whatever. And you guys spent it here with me reading this paper, which I think is, is an interesting paper. It shed light on some things. It should definitely have you guys, as, as it does me, uh, thinking about things that we need to change when we talk about organizing, right? Things we need to change when we, when we engage others in, in the courtship courtship uh courtship ritual you know i hope you ladies are hearing what i'm saying i hope you black men are hearing what i'm saying right so let's hit the conclusion remember guys give me uh please give me a thumbs up on the video it helps it goes a long way it helps in actually getting more people subscribed to the channel so we got about 10 people listening live here we should have about 10 likes on the video and if you're new here, make sure you subscribe and again, click the bell so that you're notified when I'm online. I'm usually on here 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. So let's hit the conclusion. The discussion of transitional rights as effective means of communication has been carried out in general terms to avoid the impression or implication that African transitional rights must be copied blindly. We are aware, as Ingram in 1982 has pointed out, that some black families are completely uh, anglicized and Americanized. Hmm. Completely anglicized and, Amer and, um, and Americanized. However, it is also true that there are many who find their support, sustenance, and survival in their rural Southern traditions, the legacy of slavery and African cultures. After all, the black family is African in nature and American in nurture. That's, that's here, right? The Orthodox Jews, for example, have various forms of rituals for which they are deeply committed. The guiding principles as underlined above should be appropriateness and suitability within the context of American society, uniformity of goals and outcomes. Let me tell some of that Jewish stuff. Them Jews have some, I forget what feast day it is for them, one day of the year where they hide out under like a, <laughs> like under a shack that they build in the yard. And you, know, and, and you know, they can't build shit. So it, it's real, it's, it's real riggedy type stuff. And it's because they're, they're, they're reenacting or remembering when they had to hide out from the Pharaoh. Hey, Pharaoh been dead. There hasn't been a Pharaoh in thousands of years. What the fuck are y'all doing? Right? So this is why you have to, have, it has to be appropriate, suitable, and in the context of the society that you live in, right? Uh, the pro-black perspective in the chat room says, where are, we go where are we grabbing drinks at? Right? Where are we grabbing drinks at? Uh, yeah, so, you know, the guiding principles have, have to underline, um, you know, sh uh, should be appropriate, suitable, and in the context of, of the society, as well as in the context of the goals of the society and the outcomes that you want for the efforts that you put in, right? As well as coordination of efforts. Moreover, we are not unaware of the extent to which the black community is diversified politically, economically, culturally. Uh, politically, economically, culturally. Sorry, and so on. The implication is that the contents of the rights will ne necessarily vary from one group to another. However, beneath the apparent variations must lie similarities in goals and outcomes so that a deeper understanding and appreciation of both sexes are ultimately 
uh, achieved. Let me uh, put this in the chat room for my boy Pro Black Perspective. It is also possible that the suggested socialization process would facilitate an integrated approach to other problems that the black community has to deal with. In addition to the fortifications and cultural dynamism with which participants would be imbued, the resources of institutions and agencies dealing with alcohol and drug abuse, teenage pregnancy, juvenile delinquency, and so on, could be tapped to serve the needs of the youngsters. All right, so this is what I was talking about earlier, where you can't have friendly fire in society. And this is where Kevin Kerr said, um, you know, we have to be on code, we have to be diligent, right? We have to be disciplined is what he said, right? So these are the things that we got to tap into and, and, and start being a little bit more disciplined. We shouldn't have our youth out here on drugs and alcohol. We shouldn't have a bunch of youth out here pregnant as teens. Like I talked about the lady in the store buying gummy bears and shit kids really eat, right? And she has a big 18 year old son who she had at 16. We shouldn't be doing that kind of stuff, right? Juvenile delinquency and so on and so forth. We gotta, we have to tighten up on that stuff. Not only that, self-discipline and the work ethic so, so, so necessary for individual progress could be taught to participants in the early and formative years of their lives. The ongoing discussion points to the fact that changes in the American political economy have already altered the black community in ways that distort the older connection among the sexes, adults and children, as well as the traditional institutions of church and family. Probably the extended family network has become less important, at least for given social groups. What is suggested in this brief essay is a way of adapting to changing conditions, a kind of self-help project that can be generated from within the black community. This suggestion is in no way intended to diminish the importance of the need for structural change in American society, nor the need to focus research on black family strength and stability. After all, Joyce Williams in 1986 has suggested that, quote, it is time to unmask the rhetoric of cultural values and to build an, uh, and to build an irrefutable case for structural change, end of quote. What is called for is an integrated effort that stands a better chance of yielding maximum results. What is called for is an integrated effort that stands a better chance of yielding maximum results. That's where the idea of curriculum comes in, right? In the chat room, uh, the pro block perspective says, nah, you said we could be grabbing drinks, but it said we listened to you. I'm like, where would we be, where would we be drinking if it's quarantine? You could be drinking in the house, but let me tell you, people are doing all kind of wild stuff out here talking about quarantine. You could be drinking in, in your house or over by someone cupcaking, taking a sip, you know, making sure that you have your, your laser thermometer in hand and make sure no one have a fever. You know, you could have been doing something else. So wait, hold on a second. Are y'all telling me y'all only here listen to me because shit, why not? I mean, I ain't got nothing else to do. Damn, tough crowd, boy. Value and structural transformations may be viewed as complementary. One reinforces the other. And that brings us to the end of the paper. What did you guys think of the paper? All right, in the framework of People are going to be celebrating these little cupcake and holidays tomorrow and so so forth. Valentine's or whatever. Uh, what did you guys think of the paper overall? Right. What did you guys think of the paper overall? Uh, Nikki Rand says, LOL, no. Okay, so at least Nikki Rand ain't here just because she ain't got nothing else to do. Uh, just shrugged her shoulders like, huh, why not? Let me just tune in. Um, there's still some listeners here who haven't hit the thumbs up button. Please do. If you're new here, like, oh, uh, if you're new here once again, click the subscribe button and the bell. Uh, and I appreciate you guys. Uh, you know, I'm joking around when I talk about you ain't got nothing else to do. I appreciate you guys for taking your time and coming out 
and checking out what's going on. Nikki Ren says, it's interesting. I'm glad you find it interesting, All right? You guys have any other question or comments I can read out on air concerning the paper, concerning the idea of rites of passage, you know, concerning the ideas of that one author has presented about polygamy, etc. Any last thoughts uh, while you guys give me your last thoughts? I'll just do a quick station ID in the meantime. I'll be right back. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is DA asking you tuning to the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community, only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni, inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective, where black problems are addressed with black solutions. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. And uh, also check out the Queen's Council as well on KWAZ Radio. You know, as I was doing the station ID, I was thinking about something. Quick question. We might not be able to full, you know, fully flesh out the answer right now, but quick question. How would you go about strengthening dating rituals in a African-centered curriculum? How do you think you would go about straightening, you know, straightening out dating rituals in an African-centered curriculum. If you were gonna do it, my thinking would be you have to start it from young, I guess started with the socialization between males and females, young males and females, boys and girls in school, but how would you guys go about implementing that? Uh, in the chat room, I see DL Martin says, always great, I appreciate that, my friend, thank you. Uh, but how would you go about that? Because that's something we should keep in mind as we build this curriculum. Strategies, right, to better socialize boys and girls, males and females, at different age uh, groups, age grades or whatever, right? How do you guys feel about that? Ah, the pro-black perspective says gender studies in curriculum. Nice answer. Nice answer. Gender studies in curriculum. Nice answer, right? And that's something we gotta keep in mind as we go forward with the work. Uh, Nikki Ren says, I have to think about that. Okay, you think about it, you know where to find me. I'm on the Discord and you could share your thoughts with everyone on the Discord. By the way, if you wanna share a thought with everyone on the Discord, um, I think you just have to type at everyone and then type your message all right i think everyone has the ability to do that okay um kevin care says make sure feminism is banned also ban migtow right migtow for those who don't know is men going their own way m-g-t-o-w migtow um and men going their own way uh ban feminism but gender studies that's it that, that's the that's the that's the root of what you need to do and uh when we talk about organizing we need to make room for uh participants in organizing to meet others i mean you're there because you're equally yoked in the in the notion of being organized or or, or organizing there should be some component there for you know some leeway there for people to actually speak about you know more in, more interpersonal things right okay so that seems to be it from the chat room i want to say thank you all for tuning in uh make sure ch to click the link for the discord if you haven't already join us as soon as you can let's get to work uh kw don seven says also sysbm what's sysbm i gotta hang around for that answer what's sysbm Never heard of that before. So Kevin K says, b b get away of MGTOW, um, feminism, and then KW Don Seven said SYSBM. I've never heard of SYSBM, so I'm curious to know what it is. Let me see what KW Don Seven says in the chat room about it. And Kevin K 42 says Sankofa. 
right? We must look to the past and the ancestors and allied to that, we gotta bring it back forward to the now, right? Uh, oh, SYSBM means save yourself, black man? God damn. Oh boy, you see that's what I'm saying? We're in a predicament. We're in a predicament because what happened to these people, they went out there and had to figure it out themselves. Without guidance, without proper guidance, right? Without proper rituals beforehand. They had to go out there and, and, and find their own way. And so now they have all this shit, like now we gotta save ourselves and all this kind of stuff. I appreciate the input and the feedback from you guys. Um, Pro Black Rependium says, great program. Asante, Asante to you, Asante to all of you. So y'all check out the Warship for the Pro Black Perspective tomorrow morning at 11. I'm pretty sure that's gonna happen. And until next time, man, again, peace, love, and all of that. Stay black. Thanks for listening to the Beta Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. If you like what you just heard, we hope you pass along our web address, betamedicineblogs.com, to your friends and colleagues, and share our show to all your social media. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a KWAZ Radio production. Join us next time for another session of the Beta Medicine Podcast. Follow us on Facebook at Beta Medicine Show, Twitter, Beta Meds, Tumblr, Beta Meds, Instagram, Beta Medicine.